Hi, this is Mike Delt with the Relax Back UK show on UK Health Radio, your global real feel-good radio station. On the Relax Back UK show, we explore all kinds of health topics, so keep listening and enjoy the ride. Hi, and thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on this week's Relax Back UK show. This week, it's the Commonwealth Games been held in Birmingham. And by the time this show comes out, it will have just finished. Um, but hopefully, we'll still be fresh in uh, minds and maybe still be mentioned on the news. Today is Monday, August the 1st. So it's the first Monday of the Games. But I had a quick look at the medal tables. And uh, Australia has 59 medals, 24 of them gold. Uh, they're, they're first in the league, in the league table. And then it's England. England has 39 medals and 15 of those gold. It really does seem to be a, a wonderful thing. Um, lots of great sportsmanship, a, a, real, a real celebration of all good things in sporting. Uh, I talked to a couple of chiropractors, the president of the British Chiropractic Association, Catherine Quinn, and the vice president, Tim Button. And uh, they tell us how they're keeping the Commonwealth a athletes in tip-top condition. Chiropractic is really well understood um, uh, internationally. Lots of lots of countries around the world know what chiropractic is. Chiropractic is, and when they realise that chiropractic is at the games, they they're really pleased, um, and they often come and find us out uh, and make us very busy. Then, keeping up with the chiropractor theme, I discuss some back pain myths probably the most classic back pain myth uh, to, to rest in bed for a prolonged period. The research shows that if you've got extreme severe back pain, where you can barely move one to two days of bed rest at most. But beyond that point, you need to get some movement into your back. The guest is chiropractor Mark Saunders, and he explains some of the many back pain myths. So please do stay tuned for a great show. Thank you. station that makes you feel good. It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things, make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits, and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with Zero Zilch Zip. Because nothing's better. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. So the first guest today are a couple of chiropractors who have been working very hard at the Commonwealth Games to keep all the Commonwealth athletes in tip-top condition. My first question to them was, how ha have chiropractors been invited to the Commonwealth Games before? Well, I'll, I'll kick off with this one. So um, this is the first time that chiropractors have been included in what's called the polyclinic, the medical services available for athletes at the Commonwealth Games. It's not the first time that we've been involved in these multi-sport big event games, though. Uh, chiropractors have been involved in Olympic setups and world championship setups for athletics in the past. And um, yeah, but this is the first time that all of the good work that's been done over many years by chiropractors in those settings has resulted in the Commonwealth Games opening up as an opportunity for us. OK, excellent. Now. I, I committed a fatal error as an interviewer then. I launched into it and I didn't even really introduce who I'm talking to apart from a couple of chiropractors. So please, <laughs> apologies for that. Introduce yourselves. Fab. Um, oh yeah, so my name's Catherine Quinn. I'm um, president of the British Chiropractic Association and I am a chiropractor working in North Bristol for the lovely uh, guy sat next to me, Tim Button, who uh, will can introduce himself. 
Yep. Hi, thank you uh, for having us. Um, I'm Tim Button. I'm the vice president of the British Chiropractic Association. Um, and yeah, we've uh, got a clinic here in, in Mangotsford in North Bristol and we work together. So we not only uh, work together for the British Chiropractic Association, we physically work as chiropractors in private practice and at the Commonwealth Games together. And at the Commonwealth Games, okay. yes. Excellent. All right. So you're, you're president and vice president of the BCA. We only, we only get the top guys on this show. I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Always ready for you, Mike. All right. So after that uh, faux pas, not introducing you properly, yeah. I'll get back on with the interview. So what, what can, as chiropractors, what can you do for the athletes uh, at, at the Commonwealth Games? And do you kind of, what I was thinking is, do you help before events such that people are, are less likely to crock themselves when they're doing whatever they do? Or are you more useful after the event once they have hurt themselves? Well, yeah, thank you. That's a that's a brilliant question. The um, chiropractic does a huge amount at the games, and it's really, really popular and well utilised within uh, by the athletes from around the world. Chiropractic is really well understood um, uh, internationally. Lots of lots of countries around the world know what chiropractic is. Chiropractic is, and when they realise that chiropractic is at the games, they they're really pleased, um, and they often come and find us out uh, and make us very busy. But when in terms of what we can do, so we arrived at the at the games a week before the games really started, and we started treating people. First thing we started treating was. All the people have gone on 40 hour transit times from, you know, from the Pacific Islands and, <laughs> and help them ease out all their, their stiffnesses. And some of these guys, so I, we did a lot of work, say, with the uh, Tongan Sevens rugby teams, for example, and they're massive guys all cramped up on a plane together and lots of different um, journeys. And, and um, the first thing we do is help them uh, get over their, over the long journey. And then what we try and start to do is look at treating obviously their injuries as they go and you get to know them before the event starts so you get to see their chronic hamstrings their chronic backs their chronic shoulders and you start to try and treat them because you've got time before the games which is really good you develop a relationship with that patient and they can come back and see you day after day to help them and then you're looking at hopefully reducing the risk of them having injuries during the games potentially and even um even when you really get to the to certain cases you can try and help with their performance um, with the game, which is quite exciting. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, is is that allowed? Is that cheating? <laughs> <laughs> All natural enhancement. You know, these are athletes. We're, we're there very much for the games, you know, in these yeah. roles. There will be chiropractors who are working specifically with a team. So, you know, we have a chiropractor, a BCA member that's working with the British Virgin Isles. So he is responsible for them. And they're very fortunate. They've got a chiropractor looking after them. I met the chiropractor for the New Zealand team as well. So for them, obviously, they only want to help their teams. But sure. we're there as volunteers for the Commonwealth Games. And that is to provide neutral access to all of these athletes, to all of these various healthcare professions that are housed within the poly clinics. So uh, all, right. all very much enhancing what they're already doing. So let, let me ask a, a kind of a specific about how you might enhance someone's uh, performance. You know, what say, uh, I don't know, give uh, an example, uh, say a sprinter, because actually Hussein Bolt, I think, he had a he has a chiropractor which kind of clunks him or used to clunk him outside of specifics of an athlete but let's take sprinting as a, yeah. a you know sport there so you've got sprinters themselves who do it your 100 200 meters etc but you've also got people playing basketball playing you know um rugby who have also got to sprint and move quickly now the idea is a lot of what we will do with these performance style um treatments is we'll look at the athlete and assess them via a lot of the time muscle testing so are they able to control the movement through all of these ranges of motion so sprinting for example can they hold their hip in flexion in extension can they stop all of that energy being wasted going side to side can they power forwards really really well because that's what's going to make them sprint faster and uh, again avoid injury at the same time it's going to give all that training they've done the best possible environment to perform well so yeah that's a lot of what we would do there so in that example we would muscle test so right can you hold your leg up to the side forwards and if you find an area that's not quite locking out as well as you want it to it would suggest that they're not 
using that area very well. So we would then do some adjustments that might be manipulation. It might be some more soft tissue releases. It might be some exercise prescription. There's all sorts of things you would do with those patients. Right. And can you do this like, you know, 20 minutes before the event? You, yeah. you absolutely can. I think okay. the important thing at these games is that if you've only just met that athlete for the first time and their event is in, you know, I was treating the Trinidad netball team yesterday about two hours before they were playing, but I'd been seeing them all of last weekend and all of this weekend. So I knew which of the athletes responded well, what was working for each of them. So I could treat them, you know, two hours before their match, confidently knowing what would work for each of those players. If I'd never seen them before, it's a different different uh, kind of set of oh. circumstances. Oh, so yeah, you want to know what you're doing is right. So you probably wouldn't do all of that for the first time just before someone's about to compete. All right. Um, be before we started the interview, would, you were talking about the how the Commonwealth is often referred to as the friendly games. And you really felt that. You kind of feel that that's, that, is, um, that name is, 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 is really earned and is really true. Um, give us yeah. some examples really of, of how you know how nice it is out there just now I couldn't believe how nice it really is I mean I, I've been fortunate enough to work at the London 2012 Olympic Games and again a great atmosphere such a, a national spirit and then of course we did the London uh, 2017 World Athletic Games and it's very very serious very very and, and, and it's still friendly but very very serious um, and the Commonwealth Games whilst taken very seriously by the athletes is there's just this extra level of camaraderie where different countries will support each other they're super super friendly you get the smaller nations able to compete um and they're super and they're super proud of coming from their little um the little island nation of guernsey or nui in the pacific or so the norfolk islands uh, norfolk islands i didn't realize they were in the pacific that was a, yeah. but they are they, and they've sent athletes here and they compete in get um in in sports i've never heard I, of the norfolk islands yeah, nor, nor had I, but I treated one yesterday who was doing lawn bowls, <laughs> and um, and and they get to compete in these in these other sports that wouldn't necessarily be in the Olympics. So you can you can really find um, an, a, a medal winning athlete in a in a really friendly Pacific island yeah. who um, is so pleased to be there, and they're going to once they finish once they finish their um, Commonwealth Games, they're going to go, um, you know, rail networking. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and enjoy their time. And they're going to go travel around Europe and see their friends and family who live there. And it's, and it's just got that lovely, lovely, real human element to um, to a really important uh, big games. It seems really wonderful for the country at the moment that's held in the UK. Yeah, I think the other side of that friendliness and the kind of the real positive culture that goes with it is take, for example, the Trinidad Tobago netball team. You know, they, a lot of those athletes, they've never, you know, they've never kind of travelled outside of Trinidad and Tobago before. They're so excited to be able to come and experience what the Commonwealth is and this amazing network of countries that have come together. They can access a huge variety of healthcare in our poly clinics, but they also get the opportunity to meet athletes from all of these, I think it's 72 nations that are competing um, across the Commonwealth, you know, that they'd have never had the opportunity to meet before. So they meet all of their kind of colleagues across netball and create a real, you know, a real culture between them. And the Pacific Islands, don't forget, have been really heavily locked down with COVID. Mm. So this is a big part of them coming out of COVID and sort of seeing the world again. And they're sort of pleased, yeah. pleased to be out. So, it's, yeah, it's been really interesting okay. to see very nice so you mentioned you're working at a polyclinic so by poly you mean there are lots of other therapists uh, there as well is that right yeah so in the polyclinic you've got a huge variety of healthcare professionals available to treat absolutely any athlete official team coach anybody who needs it we're there to help them so you will have the physical therapies unit. So you've got chiropractors, osteopaths, physiotherapists and uh, sports therapists working together on the more physical side of things. But in the room next to us, you've got radiography and sonography. So you've got all the imaging availability. There's MRI scanners. You've also got optometry there. You've got dentistry. One of the dentists I was talking to was saying how some of these athletes are coming from countries where they can't access dental care in the way that they would ideally like to and you're all you mean coming from the uk <laughs> <laughs> well i did then joke that i'm struggling to get a dental appointment myself <laughs> but so uh, you know they they will say that some of these athletes only 
get care for often quite you know in kind of serious dental concerns at games events at the olympics at the commonwealth games because they just can't access it um in their own countries and yes so you know <laughs> we, we're struggling ourselves you know here and there with our own pressures on the nhs but, you know, i've heard before in many games it's quite well known that dentistry is really popular when you when you have a big olympics or a big event like this but i i was surprised to see optometry and i walked through the door saw optometry I started talking to them about things. And then we started, then I started speaking to my athletes and say, look, you know, there's optometry here if you if you you know need an eye test. And then I started to realize that they hadn't had much access to eye tests. Yeah. And they've been flat out doing, I mean, non-stop doing eye tests for all of these um nations. And then now as the games have gone on, all the glasses are arriving. So at the <laughs> beginning, we went there doing all the tests, and now all the glasses are arriving for all of these athletes. And you can imagine the impact that has on a sport. You know, if your vision's not, you know, if you need some correction in your vision, that's a hugely important yeah. part of performance enhancement is being able to actually you know wear some contacts or some you know glasses I, I thought they would just be there if someone broke their glasses you know, yeah I couldn't imagine it, but no it turns out they, they've been working flat out doing um great work helping helping yeah. people right. see no I, I, it sounds absolutely uh wonderful I, I'm thinking you know I feel a bit put out that I'm not not up there participating or you know, well not possibly not participating I don't mean being doing one of the sports but just watching, yeah, but you know, cool. and getting involved somehow. It sounds, sounds really good fun. But I do have a question for you, which is slightly, slightly odd. I'm, I'm sure I saw in the media somewhere that um, this Commonwealth Games has a, a, a new sport. They've got computer games and stuff like that in. Now, ha have you met any of the athletes that are, are, are doing that? And do you think they're likely to uh, need your help? So personally, no, I haven't seen any of the computer games athletes. And it's something that I was kind of looking at yesterday, actually, where I, I hadn't heard that this was a part of the games. And it looks like it's a pilot event. They're trialing this out for potential future inclusion in the Commonwealth Games. But, um, you know, I can imagine that the sort of injuries and, you know, aches and pains we'll see from those athletes will be similar to those that we see in clinic quite often from our um, reception often, work, yeah, office -based exactly, office-based workers and the teenagers who sit on their PlayStations yeah. as well. <laughs> you know, it'll be very similar to that. They've all got amazing gaming chairs, though, that crowd, better than our office workers being sat on the uh, sure. on. Desks. I, I must admit, it doesn't seem quite right to me, you know. It's, 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 <laughs> If, if you do a sport, you know, it seems like you should at least get out of breath. <laughs> well, you know, not not here to uh, decide what's in and out, but certainly <laughs> if they uh, if they turn up, we're happy to treat them. <laughs> sure. And I'm, I'm sure in the last games there there was some stories of some of the therapists uh, bringing some alternative therapies with them, some some of which were quite different. Was it was there not? Um, one, I, I can't remember who it was, but I'm sure there was one sprinter maybe that had evidence of cupping. You know, you know, you know, cupping when you you, you kind of mm -hmm. heat up a cup and put it on your back and you get the, the suction event and yeah. um, it makes little bruises. Have you have you come across uh, any athletes doing kind of things that are slightly different? So not within the polyclinics, uh, the polyclinics, we all work very closely together and we're quite kind of routined in what, what we're doing with athletes, bringing in kind of a set and set, set and, certain sets of skills. Um, but yes, very aware of cupping within athletic performance as being something that some athletes do look out for actively and want as part of their treatment uh, plan. So I'm sure there will be some of the kind of team based um therapists doing that with their athletes i wouldn't be surprised if that's going on in other parts of the uh, the village right all right now back to more normal kind of people forget elite athletes even if they're from tiny islands or what have you what about the rest of us how can chiropractors help someone like me who's kind of a bit chubby in their 50s wanting to do a bit of sport so I suppose the, the, the important thing to know is that, you know, the needs of your sport are always very specific. So whether you want to be a gymnast or you want to run or you want to just be able to kind of, you know, take part in a Pilates session, there's always very specific needs with all of these things. But there are some basics that everybody can do to help themselves. For me, that's things like good mobility, some core strengthening. So understanding how strong you are, not in terms of how heavy you can lift but how well you can control your body's movements. So a nice rounded approach to your training is really important. And then there's your lifestyle habits. So you've got things like your diet, your hydration, your sleep, making sure that all of that is 
kind of integral to how you're you're running your life is going to be important and your chiropractor will be able to give you advice on all of this on top of the fantastic hands-on skills that they will bring for assessing diagnosing and and treating any concerns that, that you may have okay so so if someone's listening and thinking actually maybe i do need to talk to a chiropractor you know for this whole thing that's been troubling me for years or whatever it might be um is there a way that they can find one relatively locally to them? So I would probably say the best way to find a, uh, a chiropractor um, is go to the British Chiropractic Association website, where right on the front page, there's a wonderful um, search option for um, chiropractors near you, where you can put your postcode in and they can, um, a list or on, on a map even, you know, mm-hmm. a list or a map, it'll show you near you where there is a local um, trusted chiropractor. Brilliant. All right. That sounds like some good advice. So, guys, continue to uh, enjoy being uh, part of the Commonwealth Games and helping all the athletes up there. And thank you very much for taking some time out from that for, for chatting. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, Mike. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks for having us. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. It used to be hard to find the world's most wonderful alcohol-free drinks. Not anymore. Whether it's a health thing, a lifestyle thing, or you're trying new things, make sure you save yourself from the guessing game of the supermarket shelves and shop with zerozilchzip.co.uk for the world's most carefully curated range of alcohol-free beers, wines, spirits, and more. Health Radio listeners can save 5% with the code HEALTH5. Visit zerozilchzip.co.uk uk or click our banner on the UK Health Radio website. Discover alcohol freedom with zero zilch zip because nothing's better. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. So staying with the chiropractic theme, the next guest is another chiropractor and the topic we spoke about was back pain myths but as he is currently studying for a PhD I asked Mark Saunders about that. That's right yeah so I'm researching our main topics integration so looking how uh, chiropractors integrate within different healthcare settings so I'm looking worldwide but also looking how chiropractors do that in the UK with the NHS and how they've done it in the past. Um, We're looking at better ways to uh, collaborate with the NHS, basically, to help uh, ultimately help patients at the end of the day. Interesting. So does does the NHS kind of recognise chiropractors or does it depend where you are, the kind of classic postcode lottery kind of thing? Yeah, it does depend where you are. There are some chiropractors integrated within the NHS at the moment. Um, we tend to think of integration as kind of, are you integrated or not? Um, but through my PhD, I've learned that integration is more about a, a spectrum. So it's, it's collaboration through letters to GPs, through all the way to be actually being employed within the NHS. And there are a few chiropractors in the UK that are employed within the NHS. And oh. some have got some contracts with the NHS to see patients in their private clinics as well. OK, that, that sounds like a great topic for another show actually Mark because today I'm hoping to bend your ear a little bit about kind of some of the myths about back pain and also some of the myths about chiropractors in general so because you know everyone at some point has back pain or someone in their family has back pain so you know there are there are loads of kind of old wives tales and that sort of thing surrounding the whole thing so maybe i could uh, uh just start off by asking you as a, as a kind of a, a chiropractor that sees patients all the time what's the most common sort of back pain myth that you come across yeah so as you say back pains actually really common they say the stats they say 80 to 85 percent of people will have, will have you know at least one episode of back pain in the lifetime so it, it's a common thing most of us will come across, but there's also many myths associated with it. Um, so probably one of the most uh, common um, of, of many, essentially, is 
um, comes from the um, the 1990s. Um, for example, with um, with back pain, the used to, the uh, our common myth is that you just need to strengthen your core. Now that will that will say it's solve all back pain problems. You just just need to do core exercises in order to get you at your back better. But there's many different types of back pain, and sometimes strengthening will help. Um, but also there's other other interventions and treatments that will help back pain as well. So that's quite a, a common one we we come come across essentially. Okay, so you 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 know you come across patients that are doing all kinds of exercises in strength sort of exercises in the in the belief that it'll, it'll cure them, and it might not be the case. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes uh, patients are actually overloading, doing doing too much exercise, uh, and not the body's not quite ready for it. So yeah. it needs to take a longer time for them to to get ready. So the body's uh, kind of accustomed to it, so to speak. Well, one myth that I come across actually, and I think this must be just from past uh, medical help, really, when you know bad pack, backs weren't quite so well understood, and that is don't move go to bed, don't even roll over in bed and, and stay there for two weeks. Um, apart from being incredibly dull, I, does that help? I can't imagine it does. Exactly. That's probably the most classic back pain myth, uh, to, to rest in bed for a prolonged period. The research shows that if you've got extreme severe back pain, where you can barely move one to two days of bed rest at most. But beyond that point, you need to get some movement into your back. By staying in a in a static position, whether that's in a seated or a lying position for a long time, your back's not getting enough movement. So, so the muscles are tight already. Often there's muscle spasm in the back. And by resting for too long, you're not getting enough movement in and you'll tighten up a little bit more than, than you should. And it can prolong the, the recovery for your back pain. So um, most guidelines now will, all of them will say, you know, bed rest is not indicated for um, for back pain now. Yeah. Whereas I mean, you can said, see why, why people might not want to move, though, because actually it really hurts when you move. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's 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 relative rest. So you, you're getting small amounts of movement, particularly if it's severe pain, but not sitting still for too long. That's that's the key thing. It's yeah. um it's it's a moving target because as you get better, you can move more, but it's getting some small amounts of movement in where you can. Yeah. All right. Let me ask another question, uh, which is um not not quite an old wives' tale, but some people say. Your back hurts, put some cold peas on it, get some ice on it. Other people say, get one of those warm things that you stick in the microwave or a hot water bottle or something. So hot or cold, which is it? I think this is uh, still a debate that's uh, raging on. It has been for, for decades, <laughs> uh, partly partly due to the lack of research. So the, um, there's, there's more research studies that have been taken place for heat, for heat packs, um, than they have for, for ice. In terms of ice packs, there's hardly been any research studies on it. Now, the absence of evidence doesn't mean that, that ice packs won't work for back pain, uh, but it just shows that we need to conduct some research studies to show in which context it does work for back pain. Um, so some people will use ice, some people use heat, some will alternate between the two. And it's based on, on preference. So if it's working, the heat's working and the ice is working, keep continue to use those. If you're not getting that temporary relief, because that's what they're for, essentially heat and ice, temporary relief yeah. allows you to get moving faster, as we said about avoiding the, the bed rest. Um, it should give you temporary relief. If it's not, stop stop doing it if you're not getting some temporary relief from, from using those until we can wait for the, the evidence to catch up with what's happening in, in reality, if that makes sense. It, it sounds like another one of your colleagues needs to start a PhD on this. It sounds like that could be a good study to me. <laughs> I think so. I think so, definitely. All right. Let, before we go on to some of the myths about chiropractors themselves because I know there are a lot of those and I'm very intrigued to get into those let me ask you about something that I come across quite often and that, that's supplements because if you were to google supplements for joint pain you know you would get thousands of hits and people trying to sell you all kinds of stuff now 
sometimes I'm a little dubious of supplements, I have to say, because it does seem to be like a massive money making machine. Um, and if it does seem a bit too good, what it says on the tin is a bit too good to be believed. You know, it, it probably is. So what about myths as far as supplements is concerned? Just a pill that will solve all your back pain issues or any other joint. In terms of supplements, it comes back to the principle that you can have too much of a good th- of a good thing. Um, so you're only meant to have certain amounts of vitamins that, that's good for you. Um, once you get beyond that, uh, the amount of vitamins can be can be bad for you and can affect your your health in in negative ways. Um, there's, there's obviously different types of vitamins. Some are more uh, fat soluble. Some are more water soluble. So they dissolve in water. And so they're, they're excreted in different ways in our body. So some vitamins like vitamin C, we tend to be able to tolerate higher amounts of vitamin C because it's water soluble. So you can excrete it from your body without it accumulating in high loads that could be uh, deleterious to your health, you see. Um, So vitamins are important if we've got a, we know we've got a, a nutritional depth deficit in them often people go to the gp and have blood tests they might realize that the vitamin d levels are lower and we do see some patients where if your vitamin d levels are low you start noticing uh, an, an increase in your your normal level of back pain so oh, i really? think in those situations okay, so definitely a link there. It's very useful yeah all right interesting so but don't maybe don't self-diagnose go and talk to a, a chiropractor or even or a dietitian or both yeah, I think in terms of vitamin levels, you, you you best to have blood tests to see if you are deficient. Because if you if you aren't deficient, you're getting high levels that you need. And if they're too high levels, it can be toxic to your body. So it's, it's better to check your level and see if you do need extra amounts of that vitamin or, or not. Sure. Okay, good. Let's go on a little bit to myths, not in general about back pain, but myths about chiropractors. Because, you know, everyone knows essentially it's kind of bone con bone crunching witchcraft isn't that right Mark? <laughs> well that's the thing i think that comes back to more the origins of chiropractic so chiropractic was can be traced right back to 1895 uh, uh, there's a, a gentleman called daniel d palmer who came up with chiropractic um, and his initial main theories about chiropractic care which have since moved on would be that if a bone or a joint was out of place, it would push on a nerve within the within the spinal cord and potentially impact, as well as the muscles, the organs connected to that nerve within the body. Now, we know now there's no evidence for that in terms of the links to, to the organs there. Um, but the chiropractic as a, as a profession has evolved significantly since then. So we're now a highly regulated healthcare profession. The um, the training that the chiropractors un- undergo is university level training in the UK specifically about four to five years, and it often involves quite a lot of the medical topics that that, that are the same level of content as in a, a medical school, at least pre med before they will go on to to do uh, you know, ward rounds and and fir- first stages within within hospital in terms of the on site training and things like that. Actually, I should say that I have had great treatment from a chiropractic. I had, at one point, I was uh, doing some training for the London Marathon and uh, I, I overdid it a bit too much because I'm a bloke and I'm just a bit stupid, really. And I got some great help from a chiropractor uh, who helped my knees dramatically. So some people might think from that question that I'm anti-chiropractors, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not. I'm, I have had good help from chiropractors. But having said that, I've also had great help from physios and uh, osteopaths uh, uh, as, as, as well. So, so something that always intrigues me is that, well, those those three that, that I've, I've mentioned, chiropractors, osteopaths and physios, and there, there are others as well, you know, their, their objective is all the same, isn't it, really? Um, are they really that different? The objective exactly. is to make people better. Exactly. The objective is to get people better. Obviously, there's different ways, different treatments to get people better um, in terms of differences between the uh, professions um, 
obviously there's there's a common misconception um in terms of the differences or the similarities between between the uh, the two or the three professions but they're actually they're all quite closely linked because mm. we all um at least in the UK look at the same research data for the the treatments we pick for for patients to ensure that they're they're effective um but sometimes as i said they do offer you know diff- do sometimes offer different treatments for the patients uh, classically chiropractors are more more extensively trained in treating more spinal conditions so that can range from like neck to to lower and mid back conditions and uh, these these issues of the of the spine can often lead to other wider symptoms like headaches um leg pain coming from the back or arm pain coming from the neck which we're trained to do um chiropractors are also trained because sometimes people think we just train uh, just for spinal conditions but we're also trained in extremity conditions so for example hip knee ankle shoulder elbow wrist and hand um and then if you look at physiotherapists for example they often have more um experience on specific extremity conditions for example they're well versed in treating um acl conditions of the knee which are often footballers experience mm-hmm. um however there are exceptions in that chiropractors with expertise in sports such as football um can support patients in managing and treating these issues and obviously helping to ease any pain or or discomfort but i i would say generally uh, chiropractors have more expertise in in the spine and and physios more in the extremity uh, conditions but there are some overlaps there depending on what training a physio or a chiropractor has yeah you you spoke a little bit about the training required to become a chiropractor how how long does it take because it's pretty it's pretty lengthy isn't it yeah because that's another one of the common misconceptions sometimes people think that the course for chiropractic takes or just a, a weekend or a few weekend courses but actually um in the UK it's a university level qualification so each chiropractor that qualifies uh, qualifies with a master's uh, degree and it's actually uh, is quite extensive so um in terms of what we cover obviously musculoskeletal conditions we also learn about conditions that mimic musculoskeletal conditions as well so if it's a more serious cause we know when to refer on to the right professional such as the gp or for on would refer all to a, to a specialist if it's something serious like infection a tumor or a fracture or, or something like that but in, in terms of the course we, we do basic sciences so your biochemistry your pathology um human anatomy um patient contact as well so we do a most people don't know that we do a clinical um in or two years depending on the university and that involves seeing patients uh, guided by clinical tutors uh, after the completion of the first uh, three years of the course so it's actually quite um, extensive in terms of what we do but that one of the common misconceptions is that the training uh, isn't as quite as extensive as 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 they think right you you spoke then about um, referrals you know if if you find something that could be a bit more uh, serious so you refer them on to a gp or who or whoever with your um current phd and you've been looking at sort of how integrated chiropractic or chiropractic can be uh into other areas of medicine do you get referrals coming the other way at the moment uh yes we do they they're not as not as common i think it comes down to the misconceptions um if uh, for example a gp doesn't know our level of training uh, they obviously wouldn't uh, refer to us and, and trust uh, you know uh, care of their patients with us gps yeah. that do know us uh, who've had treatment before or gps that we we commonly write to about patients conditions or if we're referring patients onwards to them they often do do refer back and often receive uh clinical letters whether they, they explain what they've found so far and whether we can we, we can help and a patient will come in with that clinical letter from the gp so we can start care for them right okay so it's just depend on essentially if if a gp or medical doctor knows about our level of education what what we can do and what we what we can't do in terms of our specialties yeah and so do you find or do you think that the the chiropractic profession um is currently trying to do more education to you know educate the population in what you guys actually do and how how you how you can help them 
Exactly. I think that's a big, big part of it, really. So um, in terms of uh, educating the general uh, public about um, back pain myths and the myths of other conditions as well. So they they know, you know, what's care to seek, what's the best quality of care to seek, what what treatments will be useful for them so they can save time and obviously money, not spending money on treatments that are ineffective and don't work for them. Um, okay. But also, I think it helps other healthcare professionals who have patients that may benefit from from chiropractic care as well. So I think it works on on the different levels, really. All right. Now, if if, if people are listening to this and thinking, actually, um, this is quite interesting. I'd like to find out a bit more. See if seeing a chiropractor might be appropriate for me for you know whatever's wrong with me or or mentioning to my GP that perhaps I'd like a referral to a chiropractor. They might be in an area where chiropractors are working in the NHS or, or what have you. Uh, what's a good uh, resource for, I'm, a, I'm assuming, maybe a, a website for people to have a look at? What, what's a good place for people to look? Yes, yeah, two, two websites that be useful for, for the UK. Uh, there's the General Chiropractic Council. That's our regulatory body. So each chiropractor's regulated in the UK. It's a protected title in the UK. We've got to have the qualifications to do that. So they've lots of information for, for patients about chiropractic on their website. And also the British Chiropractic Association website is good. So there's information for patients, but there's also a find a chiropractor option. So you can find a, a local chiropractor in, in your area that might be suitable for you as well. Um, in terms of uh, GP referrals, if it's within the NHS, the service or funded by the NHS, obviously they can be referred from their GP. Um, they're usually on the GP website. It may have some information as, as whether they can do that, but they can obviously contact their GP practice to find out. Um, but in terms of referrals, normally you can you don't need to be referred by a GP normally for a private clinic. So you, you can just uh, once you've gone through the find a chiropractor, you can self refer yourself to to one of those clinics if uh, if your area doesn't cover chiropractic on the NHS. Excellent. All right. So just just give those two website addresses one more time. So in terms of the website addresses, I'll just get those up now. So this is the General Chiropractic Council. Um, that is www.gcc-uk.org. So you can have a look on the, on the website there. In terms of the uh, British uh, Chiropractic Association, that website is um, chiropractic that's uh, c-h-i-r-o-p-r-a-c-t-i-c hyphen uk dot co dot uk so those two websites are great resources for someone wanting to learn about chiropractic or find a chiropractor in their their area good mark i think that's going to be uh, very useful and interesting for lots of people so many thanks for chatting thanks thanks again Thank you very much to the guests on this week's show, and they were all chiropractors. We had Caroline Quinn and Tim Button talking about their work they're doing at the Commonwealth Games to keep the, keep the athletes fit and healthy, and Mark Saunders talking about back pain myths. And of course, thank you to you for listening. That was the Relaxed Back UK show with me, Mike Dill. Thank you for listening, and please do join us again next time.